Good morning. My name is Carlin Bowman, and I'm a senior fellow emeritus at AEI. And I'd like to welcome all of you to this program celebrating the publication of Patrick Ruffini's new book, Party of the People, Inside the Multiracial Populist Coalition Remaking the GOP. Um, this seminar today is part of the Edward and Helen Hintz Book Forums at AEI. These forums provide a platform to host prominent authors for discussion of their books on issues of national significance. We are very grateful to the Edward and Helen Hintz for their support of AEI and for their commitment to our mission. Patrick has a special connection to AEI. He worked here in 2001 and 2002 as a young research assistant. Um, he was then a pioneer in digital research and soon became one of the GOP's foremost digital operatives, first at the RNC, then with George W. Bush. And then he came back to the RNC as the chief lead digital strategist for, for the organization. In 2014, he founded with the luminous Kristen Soltis Anderson the very successful polling and analytics firm Echelon Insights. His weekly newsletter, the intersection is a must read. A few years ago, Rui Teixeira, my colleague, John Fortier, my colleague, and I were centrally involved in a bipartisan project called States of Change. The idea behind the project was to study the nation's demographic future and the political implications. We asked Patrick to write a paper for the conference we were holding, and the paper was very impressive, and it was also on time. And I know we hoped, and we talked about it at the time, that the paper would become a book, and now it has. Party of the People uses demographic and attitudinal data to make a compelling argument about the future, about a future for the GOP. The analysis is very impressive, and the book is a very lively read. Taken together, Patrick's book and Rui's new book, Where Have All the Democrats Gone, are essential reading for understanding the 2024 election. Let me tell you how we're going to proceed. Patrick will speak for about 20 minutes, and then my colleagues, John and Rui, will pose some initial questions. We will then turn to the audience. Copies of the book are available for all of you uh, at the end of this session. For our online audience, uh, questions can be submitted using the hashtag, uh, a, hashtag AEI Ruffini or to JNJEA. Hun.ly at AI.org. Patrick, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Carlin, for that generous introduction. And it's also great uh, to be here with John and Rui. Um, and I really enjoyed uh, I really enjoyed reading your book. I suspect there'll be we come at this from different parties, but uh, you know there is a lot of shared. Uh, a lot of uh, shared room for agreement, um, I would say. So I suspect uh, that there may be a few people in this room who feel maybe a, at least a little bit of nostalgia for the Republican Party before Donald Trump. Uh, the party nominated and elected, the party in that era nominated and elected leaders from Ronald Reagan to Mitt Romney, who uh, commanded um, you know, a, a, a very good amount of respect and admiration um, from the electorate. Um, it embraced the mantle of global leadership. It actively seemed to compete for and oftentimes win popular majorities, including in, among moderate voters and in the suburbs. But it's easy to forget the challenges uh, that this party faced um, uh, 10 years ago, uh, challenges that it would grapple with in its post-2012 autopsy report. So after, when that report was written, Republicans had just decisively lost an election to Barack Obama they uh, themselves expected to win. And even worse, uh, they lost by uh, in a, by a fairly sizable margin, despite the exit poll saying that they had won more than six in 10 white voters, which was a high. Um, this seemed to herald the, uh, a new demographic majority in America uh, with the rise of non-white voters growing in the electorate, supplying massive majorities for Democrats that were 80% in the 2012 election. And if Republicans didn't fix this problem, um, you know, they would effectively go extinct. 
you know, Mitt Romney might now be remembered and might be thought of as a hero to many of his former critics for the way he has stood up to Donald Trump. But the public verdict on Romney's campaign and his style of politics uh, right after the 2012 election was scathing. He was deemed to embody both an indifference to the working class voter with his 47% comments, as well as to the non-white immigrant voter uh, with a strident position on immigration um, taken to placate uh, the party's primary electorate. And so the autopsy was unusually blunt in its assessment of the 2012 campaign and its recommendation uh, following that campaign that Republicans embrace comprehensive immigration reform to repair the damage with Hispanic voters and moderate its positions to, uh, on social issues uh, to win back more women voters. And influential people across the party hierarchy uh, uh, rallied behind uh, this autopsy. You even had Sean Hannity for a brief moment after the election going on Fox News and talking about how Republicans actually need to do immigration reform. Imagine that. And you had Donald Trump say this of Mitt Romney's campaign. He had a crazy policy of self-deportation, which was maniacal. He lost all the Latino vote. He lost all the Asian vote. He lost everyone who is inspired to come into this country. Now, four years later, he adopts a slightly different tone on these issues. He throws the autopsy recommendations in the trash, and he wins. And the causes of this victory, I think, are well understood by now. Trump surged among white working class voters in the Midwest. Um, and these voters were particularly uh, uh, strongly concentrated in the most competitive states, states like Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin. He did lose more college-educated voters. However, uh, those voters were mostly along the coast and in safely blue states, and so they didn't matter in the electoral college calculus. And he wins with over 300 electoral votes despite losing the popular vote by two points. But something else curious happened with the demographic shifts in that election, uh, Trump didn't really seem to lose ground among Hispanic voters despite doing everything possible to uh, alienate those voters uh, from his comments uh, at the very outset of his announcement speech about Mexicans bringing drugs, bringing crime, uh, many are rapists and I assume are good people, uh, to his attacks on a Mexican-American judge who uh, you know, he deemed said could never be impartial in his case because of his position on immigration. And also black uh, Democrats, uh, black margins uh, for Democrats fall off their Obama era highs um, to the extent that um, this actually makes up most of Trump's margin of victory in those key Midwestern battlegrounds. So ignored in that shift was also that there was a little bit of a multiracial, uh, the seeds of a multiracial realignment. So this comes despite Hillary Clinton in the 2016 campaign emphasizing identity politics to an extent that not even Barack Obama really did. It followed the initial rise of the Black Lives Matter movement uh, and the so-called awakening. And it suggests that this focus on identity politics um, that has lately been in vogue on the left, um, whether it's BLM um, for black voters or immigration for Latinos, and, you know, Democrats hoping to use that issue um, to spark a backlash to Trump, actually did very little to shore up uh, Democratic support within these groups. And this was also a sign of an undercurrent of um, public sentiment within voter sentiment within these groups in which a more loud mouth populist style, tough talking populist style of Republican um, was seen as better perhaps for winning uh, votes of diverse demographics than the kinder, gentler Republican envisioned by the autopsy. The autopsy was dead on in its recommendation that Republicans really needed to tackle this sort of demographic uh, point of no return that the party was 
uh, approaching, um, but the cure turns out to be very, very different than uh, what the autopsy writers envisioned. So four years later, fast forward to 2020, and we are surprised once again at how close Trump comes um, to winning another four years. And a big reason why the election is so close is because Trump surges uh, among Hispanics, among Asian voters in places like the Rio Grande Valley, in Little Havana, in Miami, in Florida, and in places like Little Saigon in Orange County, California. This is a cross-cutting shift that really touched most of uh, the immigrant and non-white communities. Uh, the election is close enough that Trump is able to convince a sizable share of the Republican electorate that it's stolen from him. You know, and what is the counterfactual if Trump loses by eight points as the election, uh, as the, as the pre-election polls expected him to uh, in that scenario. No doubt he would have been able to try to make his case to Republican voters, but he would be a good deal weaker, in a good deal weaker position than he is in today. So this positions him to run again uh, in 2024 and make a strong comeback bid. In 2020, Trump also continues to do a few points better with the black vote, and this is despite his ham-handed handling of the George Floyd protest, uh, from his antics in Lafayette Square to talking about shooting down rioters and um, in really something that causes his approval rating during that period to drop. Um, and that was an echo, right, of his 2016 showing with Hispanics that uh, preceded a surge in support four years later, um, suggesting that there is something holding up, right, Trump support within uh, this voter group that had been all but written off by Republicans. So for Trump's critics, right, this is all pretty ironic. To them, he is uh, uniquely represents um, uh, you know, either white racism or sort of this academic term racial resentment in the electorate that he is, his support base is uniquely for them motivated um, by these racist beliefs. And yet um, he nearly is able to win re-election and remains a national, uh, a serious national figure to this day uh, in large measure because he was able to secure uh, a surprising showing among these, uh, these non-white communities. Um, and also that, um, you know, the working class realignment that we saw in 2016, in 2020, becomes a multiracial one. Um, it seems possible now that Republicans are able to um, appeal to voters across racial lines on the same terms in which uh, that they have, you know, gathered votes and rallied their base of white conservative working class voters on issues like crime, immigration, and cultural issues. And the trend is continuing. So you had the New York Times Siena polls, which showed uh, Trump ahead in five of the six key battleground states by sizable margins. Um, the vast majority of that lead is made up from increased support um, from the non-white working class and particularly non-white younger voters. Um, in that survey, Trump is up to 22% of the black vote. Uh, he is within eight points among Hispanic voters. Rui yesterday reminded me that the, uh, you know, uh, Biden's lead among non-white working class voters is down to 16 points. And Barack Obama had won that same group by 67 points. Now, we're still a year out from the election. Uh, certainly, this might reflect, these numbers might reflect some sense of short-term dissatisfaction within Democratic constituencies for Joe Biden that won't actually materialize when the election is a choice. But even if some more milder version of this manifest, it would signal um, that something has gone seriously wrong for Democrats um, within uh, the working class, not just the white working class, um, but the non-white working class, which were the traditional bulwark of the Democratic Party. Whichever side actually has the advantage in 2024, 
and the elections last Tuesday suggest this might be a little bit more complicated than just uh, the New York Times Siena poll. You can't deny that something has fundamentally changed about these two party coalitions. Uh, Democrats have lost a good deal of their identity as the party of the blue collar worker and the party, so-called party of the people, that um, as more of these voters have fled their coalition and Republicans are no longer really and truly the party of big business or the country club uh, in, the, in the voters that they are attracting. We're seeing something resembling a class role reversal. And I argue that these shifts, I on balance, should be beneficial to Republicans because they seem to have more room to grow within this multiracial populist coalition. I expect and continue to expect that both, uh, that both parties will remain very competitive and can't take anything for granted. So I'm not really falling into the track of calling into <laughs> calling for an emerging majority. <laughs> um, so now, what are the causes of this? And can we expect this to either continue or can we expect it to fizzle out? And I think we can be tempted oftentimes to point to uh, a number of very bespoke explanations for, well, Cubans in Miami didn't like socialism or Hispanics didn't like the rhetoric on defunding the police, and um, Asians are very uh, upset uh, by urban crime, and all of those are true. But they are symptoms of what I think are larger strategic forces that have shaped our politics and have continued to un have unfolded uh, and started to unfold long before Trump was on the scene and will continue, I think, long after he is on the scene. So I, I do think that you know, we have experienced the realignment that Trump was a catalyst for, but he is no longer necessarily a necessary ingredient for it. So the first trend here is that this uh, movement of education polarization of uh, more highly educated voters uh, voting for the Democrats and more working class or non-college educated voters voting for the Republicans and globally for parties of the right has been unfolding for something like 50 or 60 years almost. Um, uh, and it, it did not, it hasn't uh, necessarily proceeded evenly throughout that time period, but the shifts have been primarily in one direction. Um, the elections of 1964 to 1972 were a big leap forward in this realignment. The election of 2000, um, which saw the, in, the origin of the famous red-blue map created because old rural ancestrally democratic regions and states like West Virginia um, fell to the Republican and didn't really go back. You had, after that election, Thomas Frank wrote, what's the matter with Kansas, talking about why were these rural working class voters voting against their self-interest? And that turns out to be a pivotal moment. And 2016 and 2020 also turn out to be a pivotal moment. That's not to rule out that there's, there could be a retrenchment, right? There was retrenchment in 1976. There was a little bit of a retrenchment um, during Bill Clinton's elections. Um, when the Democrats nominated more moderate Southern Democrats who could more easily appeal to um, the working class voters they had lost. The second is that you do have a good, fair amount still of ideological misalignment, um, specifically among non-white voters who um, identify themselves both as moderate or conservative. Now, this has been the case for a while. You've had a very moderate black electorate that has nonetheless voted more than 90% for the Democratic Party. So why am I arguing that now is the time that there is going to be a shift? Um, there was a very interesting set of numbers in the uh, 2020 cooperative election study, which is this very large sample survey of voters that has been done for a number of election cycles now. 
um, which allows us to monitor very, very specific subgroups of voters. They found a 35 point uh, or greater shift right among all non-white voters who identify themselves as ideological conservatives. Um, this points to a trend of really ideological polarization eating racial polarization in the electorate. And I think that ideological polarization, I think, is something we shouldn't bet against. We are seeing it everywhere. Socially, we're also seeing the rise of what I call a multiracial mainstream majority. Uh, the people can, and the left can, um, talk down about the idea that we are becoming a, a more of a colorblind society. Um, there's certainly been a, 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 just a very strong media narrative over the last decade, especially that race relations are, the races are growing farther apart, race relations are getting worse. But these are belied by the actual facts on the ground, um, by the greater suburbanization of blacks and Hispanics and Asians, um, by de that result, that's resulting in declining residential segregation uh, across racial groups by rising rates of intermarriage and by rising incomes within many of these communities, uh, including rises of over 20% among uh, Hispanic and Asian uh, Americans uh, over the course of the mid 2010s, uh, over just a five year period. Um, that changes, the, the nature of groups is changing. And the argument here is not necessarily that like, look, they're all gonna become Republican now, I think the argument is, as people migrate towards a multi, this, this, within this multiracial mainstream majority, that they're gonna be more evenly split from a starting point that was quite democratic. Finally, and we're seeing this in uh, the polls and not just the New York Times poll, but polls across the spectrum, um, uh, my colleague Kristen Soltis Anderson has talked uh, quite a bit, quite extensively, and documented quite extensively the challenges that Republicans have with younger voters. But the, uh, if there is a bright spot in that, it is younger non-white voters who, um, among both blacks and Hispanics, tend to be more open uh, to supporting the Republican Party, especially uh, among black voters. Um, you know, the oldest uh, cohort of black voters who came of age during the civil rights era um, are still very, very strongly Democratic with Republican support in the mid-single digits. Um, but you're seeing black, young black, younger black men in particular with support levels coming up on 20% um, and um, you know, showing less of an attachment to uh, those traditions. The same thing also happened with Hispanic voters. The Democratic uh, Latino polling uh, firm Equis um, found that the biggest increases in their polling and Trump's approval rating throughout the 2020 election were among lower propensity voters who tend to be primarily young voters. You saw this in the Florida International University poll, uh, their landmark study of Cuban Americans in Miami every cycle where the biggest shifts from 2016 were coming among younger, uh, younger Cuban Americans. So voters who are not specifically or closely tied uh, to this old historical legacy of the Democratic Party within these communities. But I think to me the most convincing argument is that a version of this has happened before. I've been on the stage before uh, with Michael Barone and uh, through his works um, such as The New Americans uh, has written very poignantly about, uh, about the journey that uh, Current way, the current wave of immigrant, immigrants uh, and the you know, more recent waves of immigrants are facing and how that parallels the journey that um, older uh, 19th century waves of immigrants uh, face. And I think this can be summarized by uh, really the political journey of white Catholics in America who were initially highly discriminated against in the country, both Irish and Italian and other groups um, who voted very strongly Democratic, who famously voted in, seven, in 1960, 78% for John F. Kennedy. Um, and in every subsequent election ever since, that margin dropped. That, and we're seen as a very strongly Democratic group, and that margin dropped 
until it kind of the lines crossed in 2000, and now they are more Republican than the country by double digits. I think we're going to see much the same happen um, with Hispanic voters, with Asian voters potentially as well. Um, and I think that, that what that signals is not, again, that we will automatically see a massive, massive change in our election results, but, but merely that um, maybe after all these years, um, this ra you know, racial depolarization really has taken hold. People are voting less and less along racial lines. And I think that, to me, regardless of your political persuasion, is unambiguously a good thing. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Patrick. Um, we, uh, I, I thought Carlin's introduction was very generous, except that uh, she, she compared you unfavorably to your partner and maybe not as luminous as your, your partner, Kristen. So uh, you know, maybe you should, you should get some credit for that as well. Uh, this is a, you know, a fantastic book. Uh, we, uh, as Carlin mentioned, the three of us got to see uh, the kernel of it or a preview of it in a paper we wrote, was it four, four years ago or so? Um, and you know, we knew that, that um, Patrick had uh, the analytical skills, the data skills, the, the, would be thinking about this in, in, a, in a great way, but you know, the book also is a really well-reported book, right? It's, a, it's not just a, a book of, of analysis, but it's a well-told story and visits to the border and uh, talking to, to people in these communities. Uh, it's also a beautiful book, it's way laid out in you know, with color, and so, I mean, I think this is, this is a book that uh, we, we knew would be a good one, but it, it's probably even better than, than we might have imagined. So, first of all, you know, congratulations, and you know, we're really happy to have you here. Um, I, I had a few thoughts, I mean, maybe, maybe we can uh, have a few rounds of just being able to sort of uh, have some thoughts and then um, you know, have you respond to them. Um, you know, maybe you could say a little bit more about the, the changes in the Hispanic vote. You, you write a great chapter uh, about the border, um, but you also note, of course, that, that this is a, a relatively nationwide phenomenon. At least there were key places in South Florida, others. You know, I point to another border county, which you could skip over New Mexico and Arizona, and go over to California and look at Imperial County, which is a very, very Hispanic county, and that county moved very significantly too. And so, you know, it, it's interesting to think that this is um, particular in a way, but it has it has it has a greater resonance. Um, and I wonder, you know, you know, maybe there were there were several factors you pointed to in your chapter which I thought were quite interesting. One, one, um, you know, maybe that some of these counties, especially the rural ones. We're, we're held back a little bit by machine politics that, that we may not have appreciated. And it really, they were that dominantly uh, uh, run by, by local politicians and, and had pressure over people that once the dam broke, there was sort of a bigger, bigger shift than that. So um, do you want to say something more broadly about the, the, the Hispanic vote and then maybe about that particular factor? That was the most fun part, uh, frankly, <laughs> right, to, to report. And I'll, I'll, I'll let me, I, I, let me I resist the temptation to jump into that. But I'd say it's a, it's, this is an economic vote. This is really an economic, mo more than it is a social issue vote, of course. Uh, you know, they are, uh, you know, more moderate. I, I, th I do think on, uh, on social issues, I don't think they're either hard right or hard left. But um, the thing that we... Uh, I think particularly have, really have seen in our in our research, or particularly along the border, is that you know when you ask them why, uh, you know they potentially might be more interested in the Republican Party, uh, you know than they have been in the past. Uh, really, the rationales and the reasons uh, are very strongly econo economy focused uh, and distinctly, especially along the border, distinctly lower. On social, uh, on social issues. It's not that these issues aren't important, but uh, the shift towards the Republicans has been economic. And I think I write in the book that it would be a mistake, right? I mean, I think that, that, that there's a, it, there is absolutely a, a, a valid question of what should change about economic, Republican conservative economics as a result of appealing to this different coalition. Does this dilute? the emphasis on free enterprise, right? Does this dilute kind of the traditional uh, Republican economic um, position of tax cuts for entrepreneurs and, and things like that? And in a certain sense, 
It does. I think many of these changes have taken place uh, in the last um, four years in terms of, I, I don't think that, you know, to the extent that um, our sort of existing policies were a hindrance, I don't think, uh, you know, Trump really changed that um, pretty substantially in his tenure and in his emphasis. However, you know, where I would say is that this is a very strongly entrepreneurial community. And you see this, um, you see this very clearly in the polling data. Um, you see this specifically in um, the sense of, uh, you know, this is a, a striving community that wants, uh, that, you know, kind of exhibits, actually exhibits the uh, traditional pattern of as you move up the income ladder, you become more Republican. It's the only place in the electorate where that's true. Um, so I think that maintaining kind of a, this emphasis on an aspirational middle class politics of getting ahead and making sure the government is not in the way of people getting ahead or is not unduly rewarding people for not working. That is a very, very, very strong sentiment. It's the number one reason when we ask people, Hispanics particularly, what do you think is the problem with the Democratic Party? What's the number one problem you see with the Democratic Party? They're not talking about woke. They're not talking about um, you know, uh, socialism or uh, you know, the rhetoric I think you see in national media. What they're talking about is the Democratic Party seems to be a party of welfare benefits for people who don't work because they strongly resent, they see people cheating the system, they see the corruption, they've seen the corruption, uh, frankly, in many of their local communities, but also in many of the countries in which they came from in terms of the government kind of mucking with uh, and getting in the way of fair, you know, kind of a fair outcome in the, in the marketplace. Um, so I think it's, uh, you know, it is, it, it is also a vote that is, I think, in some ways strongly aligned with uh, the traditional <coughs> conservative emphasis on hard work and individuals uh, getting ahead uh, through their own individual initiative. And just, just one quick follow-up, uh, and I'd love to hear from Rui, but the, uh, the pandemic, I think you could argue, and I'd like to hear your opinion on this, that, that it really exacerbated some of these economic things as well, yeah. in, the, in the, the sense that this is a, a, a blue-collar entrepreneurial community. People who yeah. didn't get to all stay home and yeah. work on Zoom, uh, and the, the sense of government closing the economy or, or then reopening was, was more important to them, perhaps, than other groups. Is that a fair? I mean, everything about, yes, everything about these trends is all, it's a cultural divide. It's not just, uh, okay, automatically and mechanically flows from your, all right, what level of educational attainment do you have? That that level of educational <coughs> attainment is a proxy for culture. And during the pandemic, there was, I think, no bigger cultural divide between the people who were sitting at home on Zoom, the Room Raider Twitter account that was critiquing people the like home us. decor of yeah. pundits with their miles and stacks and stacks of books behind them. Uh, that was not the daily experience of the working class voter who had to, you know, was initially possibly laid off, um, but had to get back to, was able, had to get back to work uh, pretty quickly thereafter and had to bear the brunt of that and had to put themselves at risk. Um, for doing that because there was no other way they were going to earn a living. So I, I do think that, that the pandemic certainly exacerbated a cultural divide uh, and made that really apparent in ways that I, I don't think that um, you know, pre-election prognostication really, uh, really accounted for. Um, so I want to I go back to this point of uh, you know, the politics in the Rio Grande Valley because when I went down there, it was right around the 2022 midterms. And from my perspective, you know, this was very exciting. We had the opportunity as Republicans to flip uh, up to three congressional seats in the Rio Grande Valley, and it's going to become something approaching a swing region, or, uh, you know, the red wave is going to crash, you know, on the shores of the, of the Rio Grande, and we're going to see this massive realignment. And I, and I go there, and the reality is a little bit more complicated, that I don't really see, the first thing I notice is I don't really see uh, signs for any of any candidate you would have heard, really ever heard about. Uh, he was a part of either the gubernatorial candidates, uh, the congressional candidates uh, that people in DC are talking about. What you see is 
walls, walls and walls and, and miles and miles of signs for school board candidates. Now, what is going on? They're not, they're not rallying for Beto. They're not rallying for Henry Cuellar. They're rallying behind the school board candidates because that is what provides their job. That's what provides their paycheck. Uh, and a disproportionate share of the uh, you know, employment base among you know, citizens, um, not taking into account you know, agricultural workers um, you know, who are illegal immigrants. Um, the vast majority, you know, not the vast majority, but a substantial share is really driven by jobs in local government. And you have counties where, counties along the border, again, where only 12 people in the past have voted in Republican primaries uh, in, out of a base of 30,000 voters. Um, and that is more, that is less a social kind of construct than a culture of machine politics, which again, once um, you started to see the dam break once you saw that first initial kernel of, um, you know, uh, you know, <laughs> you know, you saw the sort of, uh, you know, they talked about kind of the Trump, uh, you know, kind of the Trump train of cars going through, and they'd never seen anything like that before, and then all of a sudden it surges to 47 percent in that county. So, um, you know, it was really kind of a social, um, a, a social uh, barrier more than it was an ideological one. Yeah, um, well, first of all, let me echo John and just saying this is a terrific book. Everybody should buy it, uh, you know, get several copies for Christmas gifts or whatever. Pair um, with Rui's book. Yeah, I mean, exactly. They, these two books together, if you put them on your table in front of you and gazed at them happily, they would be provide all you need to know about American politics in the 1920s, I mean, 2020s, I mean, indispensable references for, uh, for everything that's going to happen in, in the rest of the decade. You'd be, you'd be in good shape. So uh, let me uh, recommend that to you strongly. Um, I think I want to push on a little bit this, this question of economics. I think you're right that, I mean, cultural issues, they function as gatekeepers, right? It's kind of like, if I feel that you share my values your culture is somewhat similar to mine, I'm willing to give the rest of you a look. Now, the Democrats, as I've written, and I think it's pretty obvious at this point, a lot of their cultural profile acts as a repellent to working class voters. So they don't even get you know, their foot in the door. Now, Republicans are in better shape now. Their values, their culture seems to be a bit more consistent with where most working class voters come from. So they're gonna get a listen. But get a listen to on what? On economics? Well, okay. Um, it's the case now that Republicans are preferred in economic issues. It's the case that Trump is way preferred over Biden on his, you know, who's trusted to handle the economy. All that's true. But are you a little bit like the dog that caught the bus? I mean, what do you do now? You've got all these working class voters. You're really kind of a working class party now. What are you going to do with these people? And you said that, you know, the, the sort of the, things have shifted, the paradigms changed. Uh, you can't just go back to you know, the free market tax cuts approach of the past. But when I listen to what you're saying about economics, it doesn't sound that different. It's, you're talking about aspiration, you're talking about entrepreneurialism, you're talking about hard work, you're talking about people lifting themselves up by their bootstraps. Well, fine, maybe that's right, but it does sound a lot similar to what Reagan would have said you know, in 1980. So, um, what can the government do, if anything, and what do Republicans stand for, if anything, that would assist these working class voters in taking, you know, providing them with the opportunity, allowing them to have the maximum amount of upward mobility and having the country thrive as a d dynamic, high productivity economy? These are big issues. And there's certainly s segments of the Republican Party who have ideas on this, right? You have the whole industrial policy debate between the national conservatives and the freedom conservatives, dueling manifestos. You know, certainly there's currents in the Republican Party represented by senators like J.D. Vance and Josh Hawley and Marco Rubio who think we really have to change the way capitalism works in this, this country in a way that more benefits working class people. We can't just kind of let her rip. But aren't, isn't that what you're saying? You're just saying let her rip, let us people work hard and be entrepreneurial and, you know, Republicans don't really have to change a thing other than... Uh, you know, pushing that is, that, is that fair? I would say that uh, the role of economic policy in driving a realignment or driving a further realignment is vastly overrated. And I think that people have not really, I mean, I think you just have to be, we are in a room of policy wonks, so I just, I, I want to deliver the hard news. 
But <laughs> okay. you had Donald Trump right pass a tax cut for corporations. You had Donald Trump pass a tax cut, tax reform specifically for to cut taxes for corporations, mm -hmm. right? And it didn't matter. It didn't change. You didn't get any less working class support. People didn't rebel against that idea, right? Um, and so, uh, you know, the, the fact is that when it comes to the economy, uh, you know, in a political sense, you know, I think there's, there's obviously debates about what we, you know, what the correct policy is going to be, but from a political sense, people are voting on the performance of the incumbent. And when they, right now, what people are voting on is what they perceive as the poor economic performance of the current incumbent and the, uh, you know, continuing toll that inflation has taken uh, on his image, uh, contrasted what seemed like pretty good times under Donald Trump, fairly or unfairly, regardless of whether or not, you know, his policies had anything to do with creating, uh, creating that. Now, that is highly temporal. That could change. We could have... Trump could come in, we could have a recession, and that will, that will change pretty substantially. But I think what we're seeing overall, not to completely discount debates over economic policy, is economic philosophy, right? Poli economic policy philosophy isn't really polarizing to voters. It isn't really something that's understood very well by voters. What is understood is the cultural issues, and that's what people are increasingly really polarized on mm -hmm. uh, with sort of this <clears throat> undercurrent of economic performance and perceived economic performance providing an, an across the board shift of whether or not the election as a whole is gonna go a Democratic or Republican, but the cold, shape of the coalitions is heavily, heavily defined by, uh, by culture. And what I would say to the folks at American Compass, right? I mean, they released a great survey that really I think revealed many of these dynamics, perhaps unintentionally, that um, you have the biggest motivating issues for the Republican base are all cultural issues, from mm -hmm. uh, the transgender debate in schools to immigration um, to violent crime. Those are the main issues that are really dominant and uh, dominate dominant for uh, both uh, groups of voters, and they're dominant especially for Trump voters. Like, so the, you know, the, actually it's the sort of non-Trumpy Republicans in the Republican Party who have the more moderate positions on economics because they're more moderate people in general. So this idea that we have now, this actually very distinctive populist wing in the Republican Party from, that is pushing for kind of a, a move left on economics combined with a move right on social issues for the idea of we're going to go and punish corporations with antitrust enforcement um, because they're too woke, right? That's something of a myth. I don't, mm -hmm. think, I think, I don't think you'll find, you'll find very few voters in the actual electorate who think that. Well, but over the, I mean, that may be true, uh, but over the medium term, isn't it important to change the trajectory of working class yeah. economic fate in the United States of the left behind areas of the country. I mean, a lot of that has yeah. powered the dissatisfaction with the Democratic Party and has contributed yeah. to the realignment we're currently seeing. Working class people and a lot of people in a lot of areas of the country feel, you know, the elites don't care about them. They, they, they are willing to leave them behind. And the people who are prospering are college educated people in areas like this. So yeah. um, it's not clear to me from what you're saying how yeah. the policy approach that could be driven by this populist coalition and that Republicans would stand for would change that trajectory. And if it doesn't change that trajectory, uh, aren't we just looking at continuing stalemate between the parties? I mean, I think it's a safe bet that we'll have some form of continuing stalemate, at least that's the strong prior I think we should have. But I think you're absolutely correct. And I, I do think that uh, you know Republicans and conservatives should do things I think just from a pure political economy standpoint, I mean, even if, it's, I mean, that's obviously, the, the, these things are the right things to do to cure the social divide, but from, a, you know, they should be doing things that deliver um, for their, their voters right. effectively. Mm -hmm. And I think the response to date, really from Trump, has been, we're not going to touch social security. Well, that doesn't solve the entitlement crisis. That doesn't solve the looming uh, bankruptcy of the trust fund, and, but uh, that is, uh, that's, you know, his, that's been his response. And, uh, you know, from a, a large perspective, I think after that 2017 tax cut, um, really has been very little talk of tax cuts. I think if Trump comes in in a year, right, 
I think it's only a pretty different sort of administration, I think, mm -hmm. uh, from a policy perspective than you saw the first Trump administration be, because he's going to be organized in terms of having people or somewhat ideologically aligned behind this new direction, whereas the first time he was a fluke and rented them all from Mitch McConnell, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, so, uh, so I think you will see somewhat of a different direction, where I think, you know, maybe a small, <clears throat> you know, a small move in this direction is, um, is in, in a particularly really kind of looking at the divides by education. And you're seeing, you know, governors like a bipartisan group of governors from Josh Shapiro right. to Larry Hogan in, in Maryland did this when he was there. Um, but, you know, really at attacking degree requirements for employment, right? I mean, you know, I, it's just funny to me. I see all these corporate job postings uh, that simultaneously say, we value diversity above all things and have a bachelor's degree requirement for a job that pays $40,000 a year that, um, that uh, you know, that automatically excludes three quarters of black and Latino applicants, right? So, I, I mean, it's, uh, there's quite a bit of hypocrisy on this. So I think that could be, um, you know, that's a, a, a certainly not necessarily a comprehensive approach, but I think that um, really attacking this idea of the privilege of college-educated voters, I think, um, could be a possible direction. Um, two further questions on the Hispanic vote. Um, yesterday, you tweeted out just a series of fascinating graphs on, re on registration, on new party registration. And I wonder, first of all, you can tell the audience a little bit about those. And then, because you perhaps sit on mounds of data compared to all of us, um, I wonder if you see differences among Hispanics, and I would assume they do exist, um, in second and third generation Hispanics, probably because of rising incomes. Do you have data on that point? Are second and third generation Hispanics different? I mean, Pew did a study a while back in which they suggested that, I mean, this is a little strong, but they wanted to roll up the welcome mat, third generation mm -hmm. Hispanics. But there are very, very different attitudes, I think, among second and third generation. And I just wonder if you have any data bearing on that. Yeah, so two things. So the uh, party registration figures, so this turns out to have been actually a harbinger of what happened in 2020 in terms of, um, and I don't claim credit for uncovering this before <laughs> 2020, but I looked at this, I started looking at this after 2020. And, um, you know, we um, sit on a national voter file, uh, 207 million Americans, a fully comprehensive database of everyone who is eligible. Uh, to vote in the country. So this is quite a, uh, you know, a, quite a, a different type of data set than you would see in a survey. Certainly comprehensive, doesn't tell you anything really about their attitudes, but it does tell you about, you know, kind of bore trends on partisanship. Um, so uh, I looked at uh, registra new voter registration among Hispanics broken out by registration date uh, and what year and what quarter they registered in. And there was this steady uptick following the 2016 election uh, of Hispanics uh, being more likely in states with party registration to register as Republicans. Uh, and this trend was particularly pronounced in Florida. Uh, now, not all states, there are all sorts of, I can go into all the caveats, right? Not all states register voters by party. So I would not urge this sort of as a na nationwide analysis. Um, but that turned out to be a harbinger and I looked at it more recently, that's only continued since the, I looked at it last in the 2022 midterms, but it's only continued uh, post the 2022 midterms in terms of these upward trends among Hispanics. But what was fascinating was it's starting to happen with African-Americans. Um, so in Florida in particular, in North Carolina in particular, in, in Southern states that actually are required to collect uh, racial data to comply with the Voting Rights Act. We have a pretty good idea of uh, what races um, people are, um, that you're seeing uh, actually a very sharp rise, particularly in Florida and North Carolina, of the number of African Americans registering to vote who are registering as Republicans. Now, these numbers are very small. I just don't, I don't want to oversell this point. However, uh, in late 20, in the last, uh, in the 2020, right before the 2020 election, just 4% of African Americans in Florida registered as Republicans between the Republicans and the Democrats. Today, that's 11%. And it's increasing in all sorts of neighborhoods, too. Um, 
to the point of second and third generation, I think that's right. I mean, I think that's something we continue to see that um, there is perhaps a stronger underlying bedrock of Republican conservative a tendency among the second and third generation, the folks who are more established in the country. I think that from when immigration first really became a burning issue for the Republican primary electorate in the late George W. Bush era, uh, in the 15 years since through the Great Recessions up until the current border surge, um, what we've seen is uh, a lower level of border crossing, uh, a, uh, you know, a Hispanic population uh, first of all, that you know, rising economic fortunes in Mexico specifically really tamped down uh, the number of uh, people trying to come over legally or illegally and having children who then are legal citizens. Um, but um, you really saw the Hispanic population grow more established in the country. Um, older, you know, the average age went up. Um, uh, you know, the share of people who were employed who you know, who are primarily, you know, Spanish speakers went down. Um, so all of that, um, you know, all of that happened, and I think it coincides with these trends. But I, I think that that is basically right, that you have second or third generation Hispanics who don't really necessarily identify. And I want to make the point about nationality, because the, the majority of, or the largest nationality group in the United States is Mexican-American. But that is very little of the border crossing or the more recent border you know, situation, which is coming from Venezuela, it's coming from other countries, coming from countries not in Latin America too. Um, and Latinos, unlike African American voters, are, you know, really are not a cohesive, one cohesive group. Uh, they are defined, uh, you know, they share things in common, but are defined and largely define themselves by national by their nationality, now they're Mexican, Cuban, Puerto Rican, right? I don't think necessarily a Mexican American in Texas really very strongly identifies with you know some of these Venezuelan uh, migrants that are coming over right now. Great. Um, you know, we should remind you of the uh, uh, earlier mention that if you were online watching uh, and you wanted to ask a question, uh, uh, email jhun.lee at aei.org or use the hashtag on Twitter, X, uh, that is AEI Rafini. So uh, that's, that's there for you. But we're also looking to hear from you in the room. So why don't we turn uh, to people in the audience and uh, again, raise your hand. We'll have a microphone coming around. So uh, why, don't, why don't we go right here um, and right behind you is the microphone. Hi. Hi, my name is Neil McGrove. I work for Bright Bar. All I do is write about immigration and transgender, same stuff, really. So why do you describe, Mr. Rafini, why do you describe immigration as a cultural issue when it has a brutal impact on the day-to-day -day market power of working class people? And we saw this when the disease in Trump cut off the supply of new workers. Restaurants were instructing each other, geez, you know, it used to be higher and fire. Now we have to be nice to our employees. And then the other thing, too, you do, the way you talk about uh, social attitudes towards comfortable people, like comfortable bourgeoisie, is there some sort, and this is a national kind of thing, is there some sort of working class, and I'll never use this word in print, resentment towards comfortable people who talk about woke issues Instead of the Americans dying on the streets from drugs and being discarded by the federal government. Well, you hit on something really important, which is that voters themselves do not think of these issues in, 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 buck, in these buckets that uh, you know, we might to try to create a neat categorization. And immigration, you know, I think, has been seen as a cultural issue, but to some degree as a reflection of what is the, going to be the character of the country moving forward. People definitely do talk about it in those terms, what's going to be the makeup demographically of the country. People have certainly talked about it in those terms. People have also, but it has very serious, serious economic uh, consequences and economic impacts, which you also describe. I think that in the same way, 
the uh, Trumpist critique of globalization, right? I mean, it's, it's primarily seen as an economic critique of, of decline, addressing the declining fortunes of uh, people in manufacturing hubs that have lost their jobs and we no longer have the manufacturing jobs we once had because of globalization. But another thing I found really interesting in this American Compass research is the issues where I, I think uh, Republican voters have more strongly embraced this populist economics really in some ways resemble the previous kind of uh, old foreign policy stances that they're used to is that we're going to you know, you know really uh, make hold other count countries accountable and we're going to stop bad actors around the world. So I think there's a hearkening back to other issues that uh, people are importing, I think, views that they have of other issues and sort of on the more strictly economic questions of taxation regulation, you haven't seen as big of a shift uh, policy-wise. And I think that this is just all about how voters think about, I mean, they don't think about things in these, uh, in these, uh, in these neat buckets. Just may maybe just follow up on that a, a bit. And um, this, of course, goes to your point that, that all Hispanic voters are not the same, and especially many of them are identified more with their nationality. But, but certainly in Florida, I think the emphasis was made uh, by Ron DeSantis, by uh, Trump in the in the 2020 campaign, um, about people from not just Cubans, but obviously starting with Cubans, but but Venezuelans and others, people who had come from a background of socialism, right? Yeah. This this message, and again, that's a that's an abstract term in a way, but it was also right. a very real experience for people. And so um, what do you say about the, the general applicability of that? Is that, is that a more, this is more of a national phenomenon for several groups, or does it have a resonance more broadly uh, in the Hispanic community? I mean, uh, yes. So I think that in the areas where you saw socialism and not just the areas where, and you know, it wasn't just Cubans, it was uh, Colombians, it was sure. Venezuelan. So Colombians, you wouldn't think that they did not have a socialist president until 2022. Yeah. Um, but the socialist candidate uh, in Venezuela got something like 17% of the overseas U.S. vote. Um, so, uh, you know, the population in the United States is very strongly anti-socialist. Certainly the people who came over from Venezuela, um, you know, to the extent it's a very small community, but the precincts in Miami that, that do have a lot of Venezuelans swung by 50 points. So this whole issue... Right, exacerbated, and Trump really got out ahead of it going down to Miami right in January of 2019, the minute that AOC was elected. I mean, it was the, the, the catalyst for a lot of people. The trigger was AOC's election, right? This sort of idea that there's net, or you had Bernie Sanders, but now you have this next generation of socialists, <laughs> socialism in this country. Um, and Trump goes down there in January uh, 2019 to Miami and declares to the Venezuelans there that we will never be a socialist country. Um, so he plants a flag on the gra in the ground uh, very, uh, very strongly. But um, look at, uh, you know, it's, it was not just about that. Look at Puerto Ricans, right? Puerto Ricans are not, do not live in a socialist country. They live effectively in the, they're, they're a United States territory, right? It's not a socialist country. They elect Republicans, uh, people affiliated. I mean, it's not their primary political affiliation, but they elect people who are affiliated with the U.S. Republican Party back in Puerto Rico, and they can vote. And you also saw a surge, right? And uh, in uh, 2022, Ron DeSantis almost wins some Puerto Rican precincts in Orlando, which were thought to be, which the population has gone in 40 years from 100,000 to a million people. And it was thought to be this kind of, uh, this was gonna, what was going to turn Florida Democratic. It's going to outvote the, the Cubans. And, uh, you know, the Democrats are, are going to be in good shape, and that has not happened. I guess one, uh, one thing I'd add to that is... Uh, you mentioned that what do working class people feel about bourgeois people. And that's actually quite important, I think, in terms of resentment. Uh, there's a great book by Katherine Kramer about, I may, might even be called The Politics of Resentment about Wisconsin, talking to rural voters and so on. And basically one thing she finds is they're not running around saying, I hate black and brown people. They're running around saying, I hate those pricks in Madison, you know, those friggin' professors who look down on me and those elites. I mean, that's who they really hate. In a sense, they hate people like us more than anything else. And I think that that has a lot to do with the way American politics is evolving. Uh, Joe, in the back here. Hi, uh, Joe Pitts here at AEI. Um, Patrick, I don't want to make you spoil your book because <coughs> I'm looking forward to reading it. <coughs> Excuse me. 
Um, but I'm curious what you think, I think there's a lot of Republicans and you're kind of talking about kind of like the people who are nostalgic for Mitt Romney or Ronald Reagan, uh, who would say that the GOP becoming more of a working class party is gonna crowd out like suburban voters. So coming from the Sun Belt like myself, um, do you think that suburban voters are gonna be crowded out by a multiracial GOP? Um, and then how do you think that's gonna kind of reshape the electoral landscape in the United States? I think all coalitional trade off, I mean, all coalitional shifts have costs. So, which means like it's very tough to project that Republicans are going to be a majority, right? Because to some extent, the party becomes more populist. And even if it's not quite the over the, you know, the really hit you over the head style of Trumpian populism, right? I mean, it's still the change in emphasis, I think, is going to. Uh, maybe not repel suburban voters or upper income voters, but it, it definitely hasn't helped. Um, where I do think you've seen success, where Republicans have had success in, you know, kind of this quote, whole, quote unquote, threading the needle uh, in, in terms of keeping enough of those suburban voters on side is, uh, you know, I think to some extent uh, the focus on uh, on populism and on this realignment, right, um, to some extent overstates the political skill of Donald Trump, who is quite actually, who realigned the American electorate in very interesting ways, managing to win the election with like losing the popular vote by two points, right, um, with a very unique coalition that Republicans had hungered after. So he has that singular accomplishment. And then he goes on to squander the 2018 midterms. He loses the 2020 election, which I think, well, by the way, I mean, I think I think one thing we can say very clearly, I mean, I don't think, maybe maybe the argument could be made in a Marco Rubio or another Republican might not have won the 2016 election, but I think absolutely somebody who, uh, you know, a Republican incumbent should have won the 2020 election given the track record of the economy headed into COVID. Uh, and, uh, you know, had they had a somewhat more stable response to the pandemic, you know, um, I think a, another Republican would have easily been reelected. And had Joe Biden, you know, obviously we had Joe Biden instead. And in, in that situation, we would have expected a very strong red wave. And so I think, you know, I, I think that that underscores, right, the extent to which uh, what are non-Trump Republicans doing in this environment? How are they maneuvering? Because we have a lot of talk about the party being taken over or, or absorbed by Donald Trump. And that's true because... Uh, you know, you want Republic, you know, you know, the sane Republicans to some extent, you know, have to survive politically. <laughs> they can't be primaried, right? I mean, they have to protect uh, their flank. But you look at, uh, you know, I look at Brian Kemp, right, as, as the model, as the most successful anti-Trump politician in the country, who is able to essentially recreate the entire Trump coalition. By the way, you know who else was able in Georgia to recreate the entire Trump or not do any worse than Donald Trump anywhere was Brad Raffensperger, the guy who got him in hot water with the Fulton County DA, right? So, uh, you know, this idea that all these Trump voters will now, post realignment, will not defect um, if you have a more normal Republican on the ballot is not, is not being borne out in some of these results. But what Kemp is able to do is he's able to essentially recreate that Trump coalition and add in those suburb more of those suburban voters. Now, he only really reverts about a third of the Mitt Romney, the, the Romney-Clinton or Romney-Biden voter, right? I mean, so uh, he's still at maybe 53%, right, in the northern Atlanta suburbs. It's not what we're, whereas Mitt Romney was at 62%. Um, we go over here. Uh, Hi, thank you so much for putting this event together. My name is Beatrice Lee. I'm also here at AEI. Um, I was wondering, Patrick, if you could speak to a little bit um, more about how changing Republican coalitions might change, change the way that Republicans act on voting rights issues, um, which is an issue that we've historically seen to be more of a democratic initiative. How will changing coalitions, particularly trying to mobilize more multiracial, mobilize a more multiracial working class coalition, change the way that Republicans engage on those issues? Uh, so they should, it should change it actually from a, a, a from just from a, a naked self-interest standpoint. It actually, it should change or should, I, I think, to an extent, take down the temperature of their critiques, right, of, of the current voting process that have been so thoroughly imbibed by the current, you know, uh, by the former occupants of the White House that, uh, you know, you had this very toxic 
stolen election narrative that really comes from decades of belief that, okay, well, uh, you know, Democrats are going to cheat in high turn, you know, particularly they're going to mobilize people who, uh, you know, are quote unquote low information voters, right? In the, in the parlance of Rush Limbaugh, right? I mean, they always talked about low information voters. And now maybe the low information voters are now on the Republican side if you look at the results of some of these off year elections, right? So I think expanding, uh, you know, voting access, I do think that the, uh, you know, what Glenn Youngkin was able to do in trying to restore Republicans' confidence in early and absentee voting in Virginia, which was successful in, in changing some of the margins. I don't know if it helped them in the election. I, mean, I don't think it, you know, but it, I think nothing like that could hurt. But there was a very fascinating number that came out of Pennsylvania recently where the first week of automatic voter registration, so Democrats have been putting in, in place in states where they have uh, had trifectas this automatic voter registration because it's an article of faith that they're going to, uh, those are going to be automatic Democrats, right? This sort of this belief that, uh, you know, they benefit when more people vote. And I think the argument right now isn't clear, but in the first week of automatic voter registration in Pennsylvania, uh, the registration was two to one Republican. Um, and I talked to folks in, uh, in their, their edge cases for sure, but, you know, the person who ran the campaign for Young Kim in Orange County, you know, really talked about, you know, the Vietnamese immigrant voter who uh, did not turn out to vote in 2018 uh, in the pandemic being something where, oh, I, okay, I can actually get this person to vote by mail now. And that's an actually a lower barrier to entry uh, for the, some of these older immigrant communities. So you're seeing ex more and more examples of Republicans thriving. I don't think, like, I actually don't buy, really buy that there is a really strong partisan lean uh, for non-registered voters or low propensity voters. But I think from a uh, just a pure self-interest standpoint, I, I think it would be good if Republicans actually uh, were more open to these ideas. Yeah, I mean, I think Democrats, arguably, I mean, they're becoming kind of low turnout election specialists. I mean, it really, they do pretty well in these off-year special elections, oddly timed elections, um, because of the nature of the coalition and how it's changed over time. They have the educated, engaged voters more so than the Republicans, so they benefit when turnout's relatively low. When turnout is a lot higher, like it's going to be in 2024, this is actually probably not going to be good for the Democrats. Because if you look at the peripheral voters who didn't vote in 2022 and might vote in 2024, they're, relatively speaking, more pro-Republican, more pro-Trump, and so on. So I do think that uh, um, you know, should lessen their resistance to uh, liberalizing voting procedures. Uh, though, for all I know, it might lessen Democratic interest mm -hmm. in pushing them. We'll, we'll yeah, just I have see. to see all that Democrats works out. Could be. Pushing voter <laughs> ID on the Democratic side, <laughs> you know, it could happen. You never know. Yeah. Um, okay, back in the, uh, I missed you uh, before. <coughs> uh, I'm uh, Sam Owens. I'm an RA here, and I used to be an uh, analyst at uh, Echelon. So, hi, Patrick. Um, I just wanted to ask about, um, in particular... You took the opposite course that Patrick took. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. He, he started um, so I just so. wanted to ask about um, uh, Asian voters. So they're a big share, especially of like uh, current year immigrants, um, but they're also tend to be more educated. They place a high value on education just culturally. Um, and I was wondering like how they fit, especially into the idea of like a working class realignment. Are, you know, more educated immigrant voters uh, gettable for Republicans or do they fit uh, this mold the same way? Yeah, it's, it's, it's clearly a different mold. It's the one that's a little bit harder to place because I also think like, like the Hispanic vote, it is not a singular vote. And I think much more so in the sense of South Asian voters really having, I think seeing themselves as having very little in common with uh, you know, Chinese American or Japanese American voters, right? I mean, you know, and it is purely like an abstraction, a census abstraction more than, actually anything real in the electorate. But um, it, it's fascinating to me because a lot of more, the more tangible evidence of, of many of the more tangible, much of the more tangible evidence of success that Republicans have had in the post-2020 period have come in Asian American cities in particular, like urban, urban communities in particular, Lee Zeldin in New York City doing really well with Asian American voters electing, uh, you know, the, the, you know, electing Republican Assembly people in South Brooklyn, right? Uh, and you know, just these uh, these enclaves, right, shifting pretty strongly, much more so maybe than they even swung in 2020. Um, 
And it seems like Democrats are even on the wrong, but the, the increasingly also Democrats are managing to bungle the Asian American college educated voter by being on the wrong side, culture, uh, you know, maybe, culture, maybe culturally is the wrong term, but being on the wrong side of the higher education debate, right? And uh, in the, the, you know, kind of the attack on merit with these uh, taking away the, you know, rigorous admission practices at selective high schools, including here in Northern Virginia, Lowell High School. I mean, it's, it's just amazing to me uh, that um, San Francisco, with a very strong Asian American vote, was able to get rid of their progressive, was able to get rid of their progressive DA, was able to get rid of the school board, right, um, with, led by Asian American voters, um, where you haven't necessarily even seen this in Fairfax County, Virginia, that have adopted many of the exact same policies as San Francisco. They've been partnered to dislodge in, uh, in a county like Fairfax than they have in San Francisco. But what you're seeing, I think, you know, the political identity of these voters, in particular in these uh, urban areas, San Francisco, New York City, and a lot of places is that are really kind of one-party cities is that they do seem to be kind of the bulwark for the conservative bloc in city politics in a lot, in a lot of places, particularly as crime has risen, crime has threatened uh, their, like their storefronts, business establishments in particular. And so when we poll in, you know, in urban areas, right, um, it is typically the Asian American communities in those areas that are really exhibiting the sort of strongest opposition to the progressive crime policies um, uh, that, you know, you're kind of seeing coming from uh, in progressive mayors in Chicago and places like that. You know, I think all that's exactly right. And I just add to that that uh, if you look at the 2022 election results, look at the catalyst data, the race ethnic group that had the biggest shift toward the Republicans was among Asians writ large. So this is all over the country. Um, and it was about 13 points, if I'm remembering this right. So there's something going on there. Uh, and it has a lot to do with the issues that, that Patrick was, was mentioning. All right, we have time for one more question and go into the back of the room here. Being an economist, I'm Vince Smith at AI. Being an economist, in the end, I believe that most of these votes are pocketbook votes, either in the short run or the long run. <laughs> but what's intriguing to me is what happened just a few days ago with the Virginia election, which appears to have scuppered any hopes that Youngkin has in the near future for a presidential run. In terms of the discussion you've had today, what, if anything, do, does the recent Virginia election say to you about where things are moving in one direction or the other? I think it's a very misinterpreted election, and I think at the surface level, uh, you know, it's a, you, sta you stated it that Youngkin lost control of, uh, you know, uh, the one control, the one body that he had control of, and failed to gain control of the Senate despite investing, you know, significant resources into making that happen, and ultimately fell short. And that's ultimately, you know, I think what the the verdict is going to be, right, on that, on that, on that, but. Um, you actually look at that election and uh, aggregate statewide Republicans did come within a point or two on the, in the statewide popular vote, it, it, it appears, um, which is more like Youngkin's 2021 performance than it is like uh, Joe Biden's performance, uh, than it would, be, it would have been like the 2019 Virginia elections that occurred at the exact same point in the election cycle where Democrats won uh, the statewide vote by six points. So it does... It does I think appear there was no reason. I think uh, for me at the outset of this of this year to think that Republicans would actually be successful in maintaining or expanding or, or uh, you know switching uh, uh, switching the state senate uh, just based on mean reversion, right? I mean, if you just revert back to where things were in 2019 and 2020. Uh, you would expect Democrats to do somewhat better. 2021 was really kind of a, a high, uh, seemed to be like the high watermark. And I think, you know, the fact that Youngkin is mostly able to hold on to that is, uh, is um, uh, you know, a sign of what, you know, a competent political operator like him can do to reshape the electorate, particularly with his focus on early voting, but it didn't, wasn't ultimately enough. Now you look at the control group for this is New Jersey, 
where Republicans get absolutely crushed in New Jersey, right? So I think like had you not had that emphasis, but I think it's a little bit, I don't think it says much, frankly, about the election, perhaps that Virginia is a more competitive state, but it's not gonna be the tipping point state. It's gonna still lean a little bit blue in the election. And Republicans certainly had wins, just as Democrats had wins on abortion uh, in Ohio. Um, you have the progressive prosecutor in Loudoun County that really was the epicenter of these debates on wokeness uh, get thrown out of office in a Biden plus 25 county. You had the school board, men members of the school board get thrown out of office um, who were, uh, so it does seem like actually like, you know, some of these more extreme woke local policies or local politics in these places are being challenged. But I don't know that that has necessarily broad national implications. Well, first, before we finally close, I wanna remind you, the, the, those of you in the audience who are here, we have some copies of Party of the People. Uh, those of you watching from afar, rem remember that Christmas is coming. <laughs> we have uh, the possibility of stocking stuffers, both uh, with Patrick's new book uh, and also my colleague, Rui. A great pairing, maybe, maybe it's something to uh, give to your loved ones. Um, but we'd like very much to thank you. Thank you for all of your work over the years. Thank you for the early work you did this, but also just particularly thank you so much for this, this book, which is, is giving us, but I think will also be giving the country a real um, opportunity to think about demographic shifts in America. So thank you. Thank you so much.